Um, but I've also, I've got my bug out location, so I've also executed the rest of that mantra, but it was the gold and the silver that I did first because that can protect everything else and enable you in any circumstances to more likely be able to buy whatever it is that you need. What they know is if they want to hold their power and their freedom, they have to hold gold because whoever holds it retains their choices, retains their power. They want to stay in power. And they know that, and this happens again, 100% of the time. There are over 4,800 fiat money currencies, so government-based currencies that no longer exist. But gold, they always then bring gold as a component of the new money in them. And they will this time because they're going to need to get the public confidence back again. And that is a big part of the problem. This is a con game. It requires confidence. When all confidence is lost, they got to bring back the gold. First of all, what's interesting is they made this announcement to great fanfare how everyone would have an account at the Federal Reserve through FedNow, and they did that in 2019. Why in the world would they announce that in 2019 and not bring it out until 2023? I mean, I think that's really um, interesting, but the fact that everybody's got an account, even if you're in a very rural area, and you have your bank account at the post office, you have a FedNow account. Now think back to 2020 when they were sending everybody these stimulus checks and they talked about how much easier would it be to push a button and just have all the stimulus money go into these individual accounts. So much com more convenient, so much faster so, uh, yeah, there's not one doubt in my mind, but that the Fed now is a step in the infrastructure for the U.S. digital dollar. And they will probably keep the name the same because that's what they do. They try and keep things as much like what we're used to as possible so that we don't notice the transition until it's way too late. And when they're trying to make a transition, one of the things this is another thing that they always do. And, and we saw it in when they wanted to get people used to the digital currencies. I mean, personally, I do not think it was a coincidence that Bitcoin was launched in January of 2009 and that quantitative easing was launched in March of 2009. And typically what they do to get eyes on it is they allow the public to make lots of money. And a lot of people made a lot of money with these cryptocurrencies, right? And recently, well, maybe about a year ago, the Fed, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, came out with a report that basically said, private crypto's bad, government crypto's good. So, but they had to get adoption. And so, by the time that they wrote that report at that time, about 16% of the population had in some form or another uh, dealt with, owned, bought, sold, whatever, some cryptocurrencies. 16% is enough adoption for people to be comfortable enough. And when you read the writings of the International Monetary Fund, the Bank for International Settlements, uh, you know, you read these things, they tell you how exactly they are going to make this shift. And they are going to keep it as close to what we're used to as possible. And they've been moving us in this direction really since the 20s. It was in the 20s when individuals could actually get credit, right? So that definitely helped build to that 1929 stock market crash. And then again in the 50s, that's when they first brought out credit cards so that you didn't have to have any collateral for it. So, you know, they do this slowly so that they get what they want. That's that 2% inflation. I mean, honestly, that's such garbage. I can't even stand it. The 2% is the level where you don't change your behavior. You don't ask for a raise, which is what they define as price stability. You know how they're always saying, 
We're, our, our aim is price stability. Well, that's not the price of goods and service. If you hear that, you assume they want the price of this glass to remain the same, stable. No, what they want is they want your wages to remain stable so that inflation can erode them and you don't even know it. Yeah. And so you don't change behavior. The Federal Reserve and the IMF has said, once we have a digital currency, and I'll tell you, they've told you how they're going to sell it, right? We're going to have a hyperinflationary event. Yeah. And they're going to bring this out and tell everybody, if you let us do these CBDCs and accept this, there will not be any more inflation. Heck no, there'll be deflation. Because officially, there's virtually no purchasing power left in any of this crap. There's, there's no purchasing power left officially. There's three cents. So if you get to zero, then what do you got to do? You got to attack principal. That's what negative rates are about. They tested it. They didn't get a lot of volunteers. But if everybody is in a CBDC, then they don't care if you volunteer or not. If all your wealth is held there, you have no choices. You have no freedom. So, you know, I have a mantra that I personally live by, and it's being prepared so that if they cut me off, it doesn't bother me at all. I mean, it'll be a little inconvenient. I'm not going to lie. It's going to be different. But I have lots of real money that I'll be able to barter with. I have gardens. I have solar panels and wind. And I mean, I have my mantra, a hundred gazillion percent. I've been stacking. I mean, I've always had a certain amount, but I've been stacking seriously since 2002 um, but I've also, I've got my bug out location. So I've also executed the rest of that mantra, but it was the gold and the silver that I did first because that can protect everything else and enable you in any circumstances to more likely be able to buy whatever it is that you need. But when 2008 hit a hundred bazillion percent, I knew that the system that we knew died. I absolutely knew it. I was living in a little two-bedroom condo getting ready to retire, and I just wanted something simple. I could turn the key, and off I could travel, do whatever I wanted. And then 2008 happened, and I thought, holy crap. And I knew that the single biggest issue for most people during these transitions and these periods of time was food. So I was not a gardener. <laughs> I mean, that really, I might help my sister every now and again, but that was really not my thing, except that I wanted to make sure that I could feed my family, my children, my siblings, et cetera. So I bought this property and I bought it in dead central Phoenix. I am in dead central Phoenix because I knew that my children wouldn't go anywhere. And so I thought, well, this is where I'll make my last stand. And my neighbor's Probably not. I not probably. My neighbors were not happy with me for a while because <laughs> I started digging up the lawn and you know planting trees and trying to figure out how to become a gardener, how to become a farmer, how to feed my family. But 2008 was when the system died. So people do. You're right. They think, well, I'm going to know like one second before, and then I'm going to have the time to be prepared. I have been doing the food, water, every energy, all of the rest of that since 2010. And I feel like I am more ready than probably anybody else that I know, but I could be even more ready than that. And people will say, well, well, how much gold and silver should I have? Well, if you're okay with losing all of this, then you keep it more in this or those products, right? But for me... Um, you know, personally, I'm not a 5%er or a 20%er. I am all flipping in because I lived in that world. I'm a technician. I know how to read the technical language of the markets. I know how to read these reports and understand what they're saying. And so me, I am all in. I own no other than cash which I got to have, and I run a business, so there's a certain level that I have to have, but I own no stocks, no bonds, no ETFs, no mutual funds, no none of that garbage. 